uh, got a group of us together this afternoon to talk about a, a process in the SOAR that's very important for us, especially uh, those of us who are giving advice and developing plans for people who use organic sources. And it's been a while since we've covered some of the intermediate um, the intermediate nutrient management nitrogen topic, so I thought it was time to give this one a uh, get it out, dust it off, and talk about it. And I'm very glad that we just got the, the basic microbiology picture of things, and, and I'm going to talk about things from a, from a, um, a more global uh, issue of, well, how do we really measure this in a practical sense, and maybe what are some of the new uh, materials that, that I've seen us face in the past couple years and that I think we might be facing in the next several years as more products come into the stream that our producers want to use. All right, so our agenda today is, um, first of all, let's understand why we need to know what, a, what the actual mineralization rate is. Um, I do want us to understand how soil fertility people determine what the rates are. I'd like to expose you to some of the materials that are out there. Some of them I may have only got a request for information on once or twice in the past year or two, but I want you to know that, that they are out there and we might be seeing them. Then we're going to look at some typical uh, mineralization rates across the variety of materials people um, may be asked to use in a plan. And we're going to talk about why there is divergence or what I'll say ambiguity or uncertainty in our use of average rates to estimate uh, mineralization. Okay, so first of all, um, the regulations that we all operate under require that we integrate all nutrient sources into our nutrient management plans. So if one of our producers is using an organic source, we need to realize that we need to incorporate it into the plan. However, uh, organic sources typically contain both unavailable and available forms of nitrogen, and so we have a, a process or a paradigm for looking at the analysis of various organic materials and determining what we call plant available nitrogen, or PAN. So plant available nitrogen, just to re refresh us, um, Okay, let me get the, the cursor here. Plant available nitrogen, or PAN, is the or organic nitrogen times the mineralization factor plus the ammonium nitrogen times the conservation factor. And this is what we're going to talk about a lot today, this mineralization factor, or what I call the F-min. And it's essentially the proportion of the organic nitrogen that we could expect to be broken down in a particular season. And for our conversation today, I'm going to consider um, only the first season. I'm not going into the uh, subsequent uh, years uh, wherein the material might release some more uh, available ammonium. And for those in our audience that may be less familiar with the abbreviations I use, um, I want you to know that N-Org, when you see it, is actually organic nitrogen, and NH4 or NH4N is actually ammonium nitrogen. Okay, so when you're um, talking about measuring how much mineralization is going to occur, you really have a choice. You can look at the breakdown of the starting stuff or the loss of your starting product, the decomposition of your organic material, for example, or you, or you can look at the production of the end products. Now, believe it or not, people do both. A lot of the folks out there who, who've spent their, their life's work looking at the breakdown of crop residue actually have looked at the disappearance of that residue over time. That's a very problematic thing, and there's lots of things that can happen to mess up your numbers. It's much more common in the soil fertility uh, realm, though, to look not only at the ammonium that's produced, but also at the nitrate. And the reason we do that when we're measuring mineralization is because if your soil is warm and your pH is above 5.5 and, and your soil is aerobic, the ammonium actually can convert to nitrate quite quickly. So if you focus only on the ammonium, you're going to get a distorted view of what was really broken down and released and is excess to your microbial community. So in the discussion and the measurements we look at today, our scientists are always looking or often looking at the sum of both of these materials when they measure mineralization or decomposition. Okay, so how do we actually measure mineralization? Well, the, Certainly a preferred way is in situ or in fields themselves, in actual fields under actual outside in the world situations. Um, expensive, time-consuming, um, limiting. 
There's also incubation studies, and that's where the majority, and I mean the vast majority of the work, there's probably 500 times as much work done in incubation situations than there is in the field. And lastly, there are some, um, there certainly is a desire to come up with some laboratory estimates of actual mineralization rates. And there's at least one case I'm going to talk about today where they were quite successful at finding a fairly reliable laboratory estimate. So we're going to take a look at all three of these. First of all, in situ, I want to say that it is the gold standard. It's out in a real field under real environmental uh, conditions. Essentially, the ammonium and the nitrate that are produced in that field situation um, are measured. Uh, the, the reality is that because of space um, and labor and time and resources, <coughs> you can only look at a limited number of comparisons. All right? um, also, you're limited by the soil conditions and the environmental conditions that existed in the year that you took your data. And so for this reason, um, some people use this methodology to uh, kind of ground truth their incubation studies, but this is not done very often. Okay. Here is an example of uh, what's come to be the preferred method for determining in situ mineralization. Um, and this evolved from um, the idea of setting up plots, putting some organic waste out, measuring your ammonium nitrate. There was just so much variability in that data that folks realized they need to be a little bit more precise about what they were doing. So in these studies, and this is a very interested methodology, people essentially use a PVC pipe or some kind of method to, to drive down into the soil and extract a core of soil. All right? They remove some of the bottom of the core of soil and put in a resin and that's an anion and a cation exchange resin that will, will trap any ammonium and nitrate that move down through the soil core during the growing season. And then they reinsert that core back into the same um, hole and seal around the edges so, um, so it's tight with the soil surface. All right? Then um, they put the material that they're investigating at the top. So they've got a very precise um, area that they're dealing with and they can precisely place their material. They know exactly what the rate was in that area of the soil and in that volume of the soil. And then at the end of the season, they not only extract the soil um, that's within that volume and analyze it for ammonium and nitrate, but they also analyze the resin for ammonium and nitrate. So you know very exactly what you put on and you know very exactly what what of the organic nitrogen was transformed in the soil or uh, was transformed and leached into this resin at the bottom. And so this is done not only for the control, but, um, but for your, your, um, your treatments. And an improvement on this, because some people found that there wasn't good uh, contact at the bottom here, the, one of the improvements to this was to take a little bit more volume of soil out of the bottom of your tube and put some sand there so you, you got good core soil contact below it, right? So the, the issue here was people often wanted to put more than one soil core per treatment. You have to replicate things many times, and you're looking at a number of comparisons. You might be looking at several manures or, or, or actually a large number of manures. So while this is a beautifully um, exquisite te uh, technique for measuring um, in-field nitrification and uh, uh, mineralization on nitrification, it's limited in the sense that these, this is a time-consuming, precise procedure, and you are limited in how much you can actually look at. Right. Again, the most common way of determining mineralization is by incubations, and these are almost always done under aerobic conditions, where your um, macropores are empty of water. <laughs> Often they're done at field capacity because this is believed to be the um, optimal condition for microbial growth, but sometimes the moisture content is, is varied also. So it's a very common method. Um, it's, co it's popular because it allows us to compare many, many sources, number of soils, different temperature regimes, all at one time. And I'm going to show you the two different setups that are often used to measure this. One is uh, by using leaching columns. And the second is by using other vessels and actually periodically sampling your soil. And again, one of the beautiful things about this is it not only allows you to investigate what the mineralization rate was over the whole season, but if you take your samples or leach your columns over time, 
you also get a sense of how rapidly the process is happening. Okay, so here's one of the setups people use. Um, a popular incubation vessel is the commonly available canning jars. And some people use quart jars or they use gallon jars. And essentially you have a, a jar with your, your soil of interest and your amendment of interest, your organic source of interest, uh, replicated many times, a minimum of three, often five. You sample your soil periodically. Um, you analyze each soil sample for ammonium and nitrate. And then it's assumed that any, any ammonium and nitrate that's produced either by the soil that's been treated with Amendment A or Amendment B compared to your controls, which had nothing, is due to the release of the organic nitrogen that was present in the material that you added. Another way that's less often used but still quite popular is using leaching columns. So here you'd have your soil in an untreated manner, and, a, and these are often PVC tubes. You go down to Heckinger's or Home Depot and buy some stuff, uh, put a little uh, material in the bottom to close it off with a little port, um, have a capture vessel in the bottom, and you'll have a setup, uh, you'll have a column for each soil, um, each soil with each amendment treatment. And again, you'd have this replicated three to five times for every comparison you're trying to make. These can be leached periodically with a dilute salt solution. You don't want enough to interfere with your microbial growth, but you want enough to exchange any exchangeable um, ammonium that's been released. And then you analyze your leachate for ammonium and uh, nitrate, and you compare your um, amended soil to the untreated control soil, and again, assume that anything more that comes out uh, from these columns is due to the breakdown of the mineralization of your organic source. So both of these are very popular ways of determining um, in an incubation situation how much of your organic nitrogen is, is uh, undergoing transformation. So here's a study from um, the folks at University of Georgia who've done a tremendous amount of work with poultry litter. And they actually use the Ziploc bag method, which I personally uh, prefer because then um, you don't have the problems of people tripping over their feet and falling and breaking experimental units made of glass. Um, so Ziploc bags are another common, um, uh, common vessel used to do. They happen to use uh, a 75 degree Fahrenheit or 25 degree C for their, their temperature. They had their uh, soils moistened to field capacity, and they investigated 15 litters from different commercial um, broiler houses in the state of Georgia. These folks are all at University of Georgia. And then they sampled their soil um, litter um, mixtures at more sampling times than any other experimenters have. They looked at uh, immediately after setup at, at a, a quarter of a day, six hours, 12 hours, one day, three days, seven days, 14 days, 28, 42, 70, 48, and 112 days. And so we could actually see how quickly things happen and how much happens over that 112-day incubation period. Okay? <coughs> so I have a question for, for um, folks now, and that is, um, what do you observe about the poultry, at least three of the poultry litters that um, Gordillo and Cabrera studied in this experiment? What is your primary observation when you look at this graph? Okay, great, thank you. Absolutely, um, the, the beauty of them being able to look um, at four different sampling times from the start of the experiment up to the 24 hours allowed them to, to find out very definitively that there's a tremendous <coughs> amount of mineralization immediately. All right, so that was one of the two important um, observations. The other important observation, however, is, and that's something that, that, that someone just wrote in about, is that these three materials did not mineralize to the same extent over that 120-day in incubation period. 
Uh, broiler litter number 12 is up here at the 750. Broiler litter number 6 is down here, oh, more like 600, 650. And broiler litter 4 is down a little below 500. So this happens to be their low, high, and an intermediate a litter in terms of the amount of nitrogen that was actually released. And as I will try to, to mention several times this afternoon, um, while we may think of broiler litter as kind of a monolithic material, the fact is that there is a lot of variability between materials out in the real world. And so we need to understand, again, when we use an average value, that that material that the guy's actually applying may be a low mineralizer that year or may be a high mineralizer. Very good, and I appreciate your responses. Okay, now as a, as a sister experiment to that same, um, ex same experiment and at approximately the same time, the same group looked at a single litter um, incubated with nine different important ag soils from the state, and they followed the same regime, 25 degrees centigrade, field capacity moisture for optimal mineralization, and they sampled very, very frequently. And these are the patterns of mineralization for the, for the nine soils that they investigated, okay? So I'd like you to look at this for a moment and tell me your predominant observation. Great, thank you. And again, uh, we need to understand that even the same material, and this is the same material sampled at the same time, these weren't stored and looked at years later, even the same material is going to behave differently on different soils. So while we might assume that uh, the soil and the fields that we're planning for are at a specific rate, the fact is they may be more or less than that depending upon soil conditions. And one of the things um, that they looked at, and we're going to look at a summary of their experiments now, and this is a summary of both of their experiments, they found that the average mineralization rate of their various litters was 0.6 or 60%. And that's pretty close to what we use in Maryland. We use a 50% mineralization rate for broiler litter. So it's, uh, it's, it, it concurs with what's been found at both uh, Delaware and, and what we use here. They also um, said that uh, they observed what they considered to be a two-phase process, and I think we would agree with that. There was both a fast phase and a slow phase of mineralization. And they found on average that 50% of all the nitrogen that was released in the 112 days was released in the first 24 hours. So it's a very, very rapid mineralization rate for poultry uh, broiler litter. They found that the the fast mineralization rate varied tremendously across materials. That's where the variability was. And that the slow mineralization rate component was much more um, constant across the materials. They also found that they could use the uric acid content of the litter to predict the fast phase of the mineralization. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because I think that is an area where we could improve our mineralization estimates if some uh, time and money were put behind um, confirming this observation under conditions a little farther north. They did find, of course, that the soil texture impacted the mineralization rates. They had quite an array of different soil textures among the soils named, the nine soils named. They basically had loamy sands, sandy loams, and clays, and they found that the loamy sands mineralized at higher extents over that 112 days than the sandy loams, and they were greater than the clays. And so this is a question I ask every time we, we, we uh, do, an, do a, um, a talk like this. Why would a sandy loam soil tend to have a higher mineralization rate for the same material than a clay soil? That's right. It's got to do with, with uh, 
uh, macropore space. It's got to do with um, aeration, the ability of oxygen to move in and carbon dioxide to move out so that your, your um, microbes that are breaking it down that need the oxygen uh, have enough every time they need it as opposed to having to wait for more to diffuse in. So thanks for your responses. And yes, it has to do with, with aeration. Some people are also calling this now soil architecture. But essentially it has to do with the fact that you're getting more rapid replenishment of the soil oxygen in your soils that have more macropore space. Okay, so here's another study. Uh, this was done a little bit earlier by the group at Georgia with Cabrera as the lead scientist. And in this case, they looked at a shorter um, incubation time. I think this was about 55 days. And they also looked at some different materials. They looked at some composted um, materials, broiler and, and hand materials. Um, they looked at broiler litters that were whole or sieved. And of course, they have a control. And I just want to tell you a little bit about this whole sieved thing. A lot of the broiler industry in Georgia is in the northern part of the state, and the row crop land is, um, is in the middle and the southern part of the state. And one of the things that was being proposed was actually sieving the litter to get some of the um, chips out, uh, retaining the chips, and transporting only the stuff that hopefully had a higher nutrient content. So they were concerned with knowing whether or not sieving it affected the mineralization rates. So again, I'm going to give you a minute. Here we've got different materials, same soil, uh, same two soils, the Dothan and the Hiawasi. And what are you observing about your different materials um, in this experiment that was done at University of Georgia? Wonderful. Thank you so much for your answers. Yes, uh, your control here is this little diamond, and you can see that the, the compost, that, especially one of the composted samples, um, did very little more than the control. I don't even believe it was significantly different. Um, the other composted material was a little bit higher, but certainly nothing to write home about. Also, it was very slow release. This is cumulative release over time. Look, there's, there's a what happens happens very slowly and very gradually as compared to what's happening with your fresh stuff, where again, um, they just started at day one here, but you can still see that by day one, there's a real spike compared to day zero. So fresh materials tend to have a component, this fast component that mineralizes very rapidly uh, before it levels off, whereas the uh, composted materials tend to be very stable. They release much less nitrogen over time, mineral nitrogen over time, and it's a much more gradual process. Now, I do want to mention that, that many people um, make some very global statements about organic nutrient sources and act like they're all slow release, and you get this steady, slow release over the season. That certainly is true for materials that are stabilized by composting, but we certainly know that that is not true about fresh uh, broiler litter. Okay? It's also not true of fresh uh, swine manure. Right? If fresh manures uh, of those types, the monogastric animals in particular, tend to have these, uh, a very rapid release of a significant amount of material before stuff levels off. And there may be, as in this case, some gradual release between 30 and 58 days, but it certainly um, didn't, didn't level off until um, a very late in time. <coughs> Good. <coughs> Excuse me a minute. So anyway, if we were to look at this in a little diagram here, if this is all the nitrogen in the uh, poultry litter as it's being sampled, okay, we've got some of it that already exists in an, in an ammonium form. We have some that exist in urea from the breakdown of uric acid. Um, and then we have other organic nitrogen forms within the organic pool. Now, this is going to be a mixed bag of things. This can be anything from um, cell wall material that was sloughed off um, as the material was going through the animal's digestive tract. 
It can be micro bodies from the digestive tract. It can be undigested feed. This component here is going to vary in stability. But these two components here, uric acid and urea, because they're simple compounds and they are very labile, they're going to change quite rapidly when you put them into the soil. Now compare that to compost. It's already been stabilized, all right? So there are no label, labile sources in the organic pool. The soil microbes have already taken care of anything that's labile while it was undergoing composting. So you've got a very stable organic component here. And then hopefully, if the material's actually been truly composted, a very low amount of actual um, ammonium nitrogen and emet usually not measurable amounts of nitrate. Okay, so here I've tried to show it again. Um, your other organic sources will increase, will, will exist in increasing stability where some of these may break down this year, but others may exist for a number of years. Your uric acid and urea in your poultry litter are very labile, and these are probably the things that are turning over in a day or day and a half, and your ammonium is in the available form. Whereas in the compost, you can have very little ammonium, and most of it's going to be in a very stable organic form. Okay, so folks really want to get to the point where there is a laboratory estimate that can be, uh, we can encourage soil and manure testing labs to adopt so we actually know what the, what the potential mineralization rate is of a particular material. Um, in most parts of the country now, if, if you're required to have any kind of a nutrient management plan or comprehensive nutrient management plan, a manure analysis is already being required and is being done. So the thought is, let's come up with a good laboratory <laughs> estimate that would actually give us a handle on the potential net mineralization rate of the material while we're at it. Now again, we're looking for something that isn't going to take more than a day or two because the testing labs want to um, maintain reasonable turnaround in samples, and it would be nice if they could do it with the kinds of equipment that already exists in soil and manure testing labs. So this is what people have had in mind if they, as they've looked at at various methods. Well, again, the folks at University of Georgia are the ones that have found that actually something called water-soluble organic nitrogen is quite good as, a, as an estimate, a laboratory estimate of net mineralization. And of course, it works well because there are two sources of organic nitrogen in there that are soluble, or urea and, and uh, uric acid. And so let's look at a graph that shows how well this measurement, water-soluble organic nitrogen, compares with the actual mineralization rate that was observed in a very extensive incubation study. Now, they had 20 different, excuse me, 60 different um, samples as part of this experiment. This is your potential mineralized nitrogen in grams of nitrogen per kilogram uh, of uh, material. And you can see that the water-soluble organic nitrogen is really quite strongly related to the, to the uh, potential mineralization uh, that they found um, in their incubation study. And, and one way we measure how good something like this is, in addition to looking at the, the scatter, is what the R-square is. Okay? And an R-square of 0.87 is really good. So this certainly is something that, that folks could consider in um, confirming in their own region to see whether or not they get the same high um, R-square, and that could theoretically, um, theoretically testing labs could be encouraged to, uh, to uh, integrate a test like this into the manure analysis uh, that's already being done. Now, I will say that this test requires um, about two days, which is not outside the time range when a manure would be in a testing lab anyway. It does require a piece of equipment that might not be in most testing labs. It, it requires um, HPLC, high-performance liquid chromatography, to separate out the uric acid. Um, however, it's, uh, it looks very promising as a way of determining what the potential mineralization might be. That would at least help us with the differences between materials that we observed um, a couple slides ago. It wouldn't help us with the environmental conditions, but it would help us with the differences between materials. Okay, so um, I, I'd like to talk for just a minute about the fact that because we've got some very labile materials, 
what happens when poultry uh, litter um, excrete their waste um, is, is, is pretty interesting. As it's excreted, uh, um, different researchers have found, and this has got to be super interesting work to do, uh, that about 50 to 70 percent of the total N that's released by the animal is actually in the uric acid form. However, quite rapidly, and you can tell this by going into any chicken holding facility, quite rapidly that uric acid undergoes transformation to urea and then to ammonium, and so ammonium and then thus ammonia can be produced. All right? At sampling time, and this is based on the samples we actually see come in through labs and, and in our plans, um, there's about a third of the total um, nitrogen in the litter samples as they're sampled that exists in the ammonium form with the others in the organic form. Okay? But realize that the methodology used to discriminate uh, organic versus ammonium is pretty crude. All we know when we look at the organic um, nitrogen is how much is in this total pool. We don't break out uric acid and we don't break out urea. They're all mushed together into that organic N component. And, and it's these two parts that, that show up in the water-soluble organic nitrogen pool uh, that are the parts that could be useful to predict mineralization um, uh, in, in the various litters. Uh, if we can confirm the relationship that Cabrera's group found in Georgia between that and the potentially mineralized nitrogen in an incubation study. Okay, now a question always comes up when we start talking about lab studies is, well, that's nice, but how well is that related to full season plant available nitrogen? Um, and this would be ground truth with some field studies. Well, there hasn't been uh, a good study done in the, in the, on the east coast of that, but a group out in Washington and Oregon where there's a lot of interest in, in using many, many organic sources got together and, and did a very extensive study. It was a two-year study. Uh, there, were, there was a field site in both Oregon and Washington. There was a laboratory comparison in both states, and they looked at 37 different materials that included broiler litters, dairy solids, rabbit manure, yard trimmings, specialty products, and these are sold in the, in the uh, commercial market, and various composts. And they, too, found that there was a, a, a very good relationship between the full season plant available nitrogen measured in the field and the laboratory uh, nitrogen that they measured in a 70-day incubation study. So I think we can have fairly good confidence. Now again, this is a different region. We may want to confirm this back under conditions of the Mid-Atlantic, but um, at least under this circumstance we found that there, there can be a very good relationship between the appropriate uh, um, between laboratory uh, incubations uh, as they estimate PAN and full season out in the, in the field, in situ, plant available nitrogen. Okay, so let's go on to some of the different things we're seeing. Um, there's a, a number of different things out there in the commercial market. Um, you know, in the 90s, most of our focus was on the various animal manures, but there's a whole lot more out there now that people are interested in integrating into their nutrient management plan, putting on their fields as nitrogen sources. Uh, we have a fair amount of meat and seafood processing residuals even here in Maryland because of our industry. There's some interest in plant products, and I'll go into why when we talk about this. There are a number of instances where yard waste composts um, and various residuals are being looked at. There are um, both commercial and on-farm composts that are being integrated into nutrient management plans. And then there's bioenergy residuals that, that I've seen some interest in and that we might see more interest in as time goes on. So I want to just go through a few of those. Okay, first of all, these are the mineralization rates that are used for, for um, these common animal groups in Maryland. And this is all in our, our regulations. We, uh, we have broiler, layer, sheep, goats, um, beef and dairy, swine, horse. And this is the year of application. And this is how much of the organic nitrogen in your material you could expect to be mineralized the year of application. And we can see here that animal type is very important. Not only because there's different ways they're fed, there's different kinds of, of, of feeds that are fed these animals, but also because of differences in digestive systems. So these are materials we're quite convenient, or quite familiar with, and are um, quite used to handling. 
Here's some information on some products from the meat and fish processing industry. Now, blood meal is a commercial product, um, and it, it is uh, dried and um, sold in the commercial market. That is, you can go to a store and buy it. Um, feather meal is um, not usually seen as an individually uh, sold product, but it's in many of the organic mixtures that you can find on the market. Fish powder and pelletized fish byproduct um, are, often out, are, are also out there for sale, and they're often used in, again, these mixed products. And you can see that when they were looked at as individual materials, that blood meal has has um, a, a quite high mineralization rate, 65 to 70, depending upon uh, who studied it. Um, hydrolyzed feather meal is also quite high, 60 to 65. We need to be aware of fresh feather meal. The uh, nitrogen in fresh feather meal that hasn't been hydrolyzed is uh, quite, quite low in its availability, although most of the products available now are, in fact, hydrolyzed. They've been steam hydrolyzed or treated with ammonium hydroxide. There's some fish powders out there, both as, as um, discrete products and in mixtures of organic products. They're pretty high also. And there's a pelletized fish product that, that's been studied in the European market that's almost 100% available. 93% of the organic nitrogen was available the year of application. So it looks like the meat and, and fish stuff is considerably, um, uh, is as high or higher than our highest mineralizing animal manure, just to put it on a relative scale. Okay, Then there's some plant products, and I'd like to, to just mention that um, there's a lot of interest in this in, <coughs> in Europe, and there's some interest in this among many of our organic growers. What I found in the past couple of years is that if an organic grower is a, is a vegetarian, they not only don't want to eat meat products, but they don't want to use animal and fish residuals in their production operation. So we've, we've had to um, do some searching for a wider array of plant products that one might use as a nutrient source. Well, castor cake is the, is the result of, of a pressing um, castor beans for their oil that has an industrial usage, and, and that has a modest, well, a fairly substantial mineralization rate of 0.45. Lupine seed meal is used a lot in Europe. Lupines are a leguminous uh, flower, to my knowledge. I don't know why they have enough that they're using it for uh, production, but anyway, they are, and it has a 0.35. It's down with uh, down around uh, beef, beef and dairy manure. And there's also a commercial product called phytopearls or phytopellets. That's a pretty substantial nitrogen source. It contains about 7% total nitrogen. It's from corn processing, and it has a 30% mineralization rate. So overall, it looks like some of these products are significantly lower than what we're seeing in terms of the mineralization rate from the animal byproducts. But for those people who, for philosophical reasons, want to use it, there are materials out there that are available and that we have some information on. Another thing we're seeing a lot of is uh, composting of yard waste, and in some cases, the desire to use materials from yard waste collections even in, in their fresh condition. Um, these first two materials, Hux Henblend and Panorama <coughs> Pay Dirt, are actually commercial uh, compost products sold by composting facilities in the state of Virginia. Now, Hux Hen Henblend is actually eight parts of yard waste to one part of Henblend. It has a a CN ratio of 29, um, and it has a, an extremely low mineralization rate. I think I figured out that you'd have to use 25 tons on this to get one pound of plant available nitrogen. It's uh, barely measurable uh, above, above zero. Then there's this panorama called Panorama Pay Dirt. It's one part of yard waste to two parts of poultry litter. It has a CN ratio of 19, and it actually has a low but, but a significant uh, mineralization rate and is up there with with uh, kind of our average compost mineralization rate across many studies and many materials. Then there's some people that actually want to look at fresh leaves, and I always um, warn against that. These are actually negative mineralization rates, which mean that they're immobilizing nitrogen. Now, they're not immobilizing a whole lot, and there's certainly a difference between textual class. There was more immobilization with a, a, sand, a sandy clay loam than there was a sandy loam. But uh, the fact is you can't count on um, fresh leaves to give you anything, and they're actually going to tie up a little bit. Then there's a desire for people, and there's actually a client that we dealt with, uh, actually several clients this year, 
that want to use fresh grass clippings. And, and they actually have um, a significant mineralization rate. And again, there were some differences among soil textures. For the same materials, the mineralization rate for a uh, sandy clay loam was 0.25 or 25%, whereas for um, uh, sandy loam, it was 40% or 0.4. Um, there's huge emphasis in New Jersey and actually a state law that requires that these um, grass clippings and leaves and all not go to the landfill. They have to be utilized somehow. So there's tremendous interest up there in using them directly on ag land. There's a lot of it. Got to do something with it, OK? Now here's some composted materials. These first three are actually commercial materials that are sold in, in uh, home and garden stores, Bovung, Fertilife, Earth Life Carbon. Um, the first two had very low but negative mineralization rates. That means they actually, there was actually less ammonium and nitrate in the soils that received these materials than in the control soil. Whereas Earthrite C had a low but positive mineralization rate. And in an example of an on-farm compost that was made of sheep manure and household food waste, uh, again, actually a negative mineralization rate. That means stuff's getting, nitrogen's getting immobilized in the soil that this is getting um, applied to. Okay, I want to talk just a little bit about the bioenergy residuals. Uh, we don't have any bioethanol plants to my knowledge in Maryland, and I don't know that we have much biodiesel manufacturing going on except the small scale stuff, and Lord only knows what they're doing with the residue. I don't want to know. Um, but. Uh, we do have uh, at least one methane digester that I know of, although this is not their data. Uh, and my concern is that in the regions where this is popular, there's a lot of material getting produced. And just as we're transporting poultry litter out of the eastern shore because we have an excess, I think in time we're going to see excesses of these materials coming out of the Midwest and the states farther west of us where there is more activity. So I want to emphasize that the various oil seeds can be used to make biodiesel. And I did find an example of both canola meal from biodiesel and mustard seed meal from biodiesel. And you can see that there's, there appears to be um, a significant difference in the mineralization rate depending upon what the feedstock that was used. The males would be some process differences, I don't know. So when people start saying, oh, I've got some residue, I want to know biodiesel residue, I want to use it in a nutrient management plan, what can we expect? I think the first thing we need to find out is what was your feedstock, right? Same thing with bioethanol residue. There was a difference between the bioethanol residue from wheat as opposed to corn. So again, if these materials show up, we're going to uh, need to know what the ethanol was made from at a very minimum. And as more and more literature um, hits, um, I'll certainly keep up with what's going on with these. I did find one example of uh, a methane um, uh, digestate, the, the stuff that's left over. And in this case, swine manure was the feedstock, and it was quite low. Um, there's some fairly extensive work being done with mixing manures with other things, particularly glycerin for some reason. There must be a lot of waste glycerin on the market. And I got to tell you that depending upon <coughs> what you mix with your manure, your mineralization rate can be all over the place. So again, if folks start approaching us about wanting to integrate these materials into plants, we're going to have to be very curious with them about where, uh, where it came from, what was used as a feedstock, so we can um, use the best information possible when we integrate the material into their plan in terms of knowing a reasonable mineralization rate. Okay, this is a, a slide. Um, when you get the slide set, and, and we'll have this on our website next week sometime, this was a study um, uh, done it in uh, Germany, and Gunster published this in the Journal of Plant Nutrition and Soil Science. He did some of this work himself, but he also did a rather thorough literature review of um, everything he could find out that people ever used on the land. And a and, um, couple things I want to point out. Um, they call what they're looking at mineral fertilizer equivalents, but it's, it's comparable to our notion of mineralization um, um, rate, okay? So down here there were the composts, and he found that compost, or what he called biocompost, could be anywhere between a, equivalent to no, nitrogen, no mineral nitrogen or 20% mineral nitrogen. Well, we tend to find on average that composts 
uh, are down about 5% if you're lucky and maybe zero or negative, okay? But again, this is not outside the realm of what we see. So the point I want to make here is, is uh, uh, there's a whole range of, of potential mineralization rates out there, and they range anything from zero <coughs> to 100. Um, the highest one here, the, the, 90, the 90 to 100, is actually uh, urine. And this is actually human urine, um, because there are facilities in Europe um, and, and in the Middle East, I, I know of at least some in Scandinavia and some in Israel, where they have special toilets in public facilities and they actually capture the urine and keep it separate and, and allow it to be used on cropland. And urine, because human urine um, is basically urea with whatever other waste we've got in our system, um, and we know that urea is very labile, it breaks down, it can break down to virtually 100%. And we've got everything in between. So notice that for any material we're looking at, there's a range, all right? We, we know that based on our discussions today, and that some materials mineralize to a very low extent, and his, his biocompost and his solid manures here are, are down in the low range. Um, legume meals are up here in the middle. Uh, poultry litter's up here where we'd expect it, 60 to 70, and there's some things like, like urine that are actually up about 100%. So when you get the, the um, PowerPoint slides, you'll be able to see this very well, but the fact is, for any particular material, there's a range, and for the range of materials that are out there, the mineralization rate could be anything from 100% to zero, okay? Okay, now there is uncertainty in utilization, utilizing organic sources. Of the uh, tabled values that we have are averages, and, and hopefully we remember after our discussion today that the actual rates may vary due to the, to the composition of the particular material you're using, the soil in which you're using it on, or the weather conditions. Um, and it's very important to, um, to confirm that there's adequate nitrogen for your crops where you're fertilizing with organic sources. If there's a test available, use it, okay, um, as there is for corn. If there's not, keep an eye on your crop and uh, make sure that it, it's growing adequately and isn't showing any signs of a nitrogen insufficiency, okay. We, we know that there's variability within a source type. Um, there's a Delaware study that was done in the uh, late 80s that looked at 20 different litters from commercial houses, and while they found that the average was 66%, they actually found that the, the range of mineralization rates was as low as 21 or as high as 100. The Georgia study that we've already looked at found that the average was 60. Their range was 41 to 85. A little bit tighter, but again, the, the averages are hovering around the same thing. Uh, USDA did a study of 170 dairy manures in the Northeast. Um, this was probably in the last uh, seven to 10 years. They found that the mineralization rates varied from zero to 55%. So within a source type, and that would be litter or dairy manure, there can be tremendous variability among the actual mineralization rates of the specific material. All right. Does the weather have an impact? You bet. If it's cooler than usual, things might be slower. If it's wetter than usual, things might be slower. If it's drier than usual, things might be slower. And I'm going to show you a couple graphs here with some data where people actually varied some of these things so we can see the actual effects. Right. Here's a graph done by a group. Um, uh, it was published in the Soil Science Society um, uh, Journal in, in 2012. They looked at um, carbon mineralization, the CO2 that's given off, okay, but it's essentially measuring the same kind of a phenomenon. They looked at four temperatures, 5 degrees C, um, 12, um, 18, 25, um, and they, in this graph, are showing 20% of the available moisture, 26% of the available moisture, 22, 14, and 10. Now, these are all relatively dry soils in the sense that the moisture content they were considering was the um, percent of available moisture, the moisture between fill capacity and wilting point. So to only have 26% of that left is already on the low side for a sensitive crop like vegetables. But this certainly could represent what's going on in our fields in the summertime. You know, I'm sure that when we have infrequent rainfalls, we get down to 26% of available moisture and maybe even down to 10% of available moisture. So it's probably more typical of field conditions under rain-fed agriculture in a climate like ours. And there's a couple things you might notice. You know, there's less, carb there's less microbial activity in carbon dioxide <coughs> given off at 5, then there is at 12, then there is at 
15 than there, or 18 than there is at 25. The warmer the soil is, no matter what, what temperature we're looking at, the warmer the soil is, the more microbial activity there is, the more carbon dioxide given off, the more potential mineralization that's happening. And there really isn't much difference here, as, as I see it, between the 26 and the 22% moisture. 14, we're starting to see a depression in activity, and certainly by 10% moisture, we're starting to see a real depression in activity. So as soils dry out, there's going to be less mineralization, and uh, there's going to be more mineralization in warmer soils than there is in cooler soils. And there's one more graph, and this isn't the clearest thing in the universe, and I apologize for it, but it's a classic, and I have to share it with you. This is work done by Honeycutt when he was up at USDA in Maine years ago. Um, he's now downtown at USDA NRCS. But he looked at the breakdown of a common material in the state of Maine, paper um, mill sludge. And he looked at um, six temperatures, 5, 10, 15, up to, um, I think this is, I can't even tell what this is. Um, the warmest, okay? And, um, and you can see he looked at an incubation of, I think, 78 days. And um, there was a depression period here where there wasn't anything uh, released. This is a, a total ammonium and nitrate over here on this axis. And the warmest soil mineralized the most, and the next warmer soil mineralized the next. And, you know, there was these family of curves depending upon what temperature the soil with the waste was held at. But when he expressed that temperature, on a growing degree day basis, uh, most of the temperatures laid right down on top of one another, and the only one that diverged was the warmest temperature. Okay? So this is reinforcing the fact that this concept of looking at heat units or degree days is useful for a whole array of things across agriculture. It's useful for predicting when your pests are going to uh, show up. It's useful for predict predicting when it's time to side dress your wheat. And in this case, it's a useful indicator of, um, of how <laughs> rapidly your organic material might be breaking down. And the, one of the reasons I want to share this with us is because I know that, that some years, and I think last year was one of them, where we had a cooler spring. And at, at the time the, the corn uh, was taking off and going into its rapid growth state, we hadn't accumulated as many growing degree days as we had other years. I, now, I didn't track the data, but I just had a sense from living through the various years. And, and this certainly explains why this is happening. If you haven't had the hours of soil at, at a warm enough temperature for your microbes to function optimally, you're not going to have as much release. And so your, your mineralization that you observe under those conditions is certainly going to be less. OK, so overall, let me say that the nutrients contained in organic molecules have to be mineralized before they're available for plant growth, either in the ammonium or the nitrate form. And for a specific <laughs> organic material type, litter, dairy, compost, there's a lot of variability across materials, and we need to be cognizant of that. We need to understand that the same material can mineralize at a different rate in different soils. And we need to understand that our environmental conditions affect mineralization and that they can vary from year to year, even for the same material. Right? So um, with that, I just want to reinforce that we've looked at this little part of the nitrogen cycle down here. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be glad to um, answer them now. OK. OK, so the glycerin's coming from biodiesel. OK, so the, there must be a solid material that's left and then a liquid material, I guess. OK. Thanks, Amanda, because I was wondering why they were mixing different amounts of glycerin with the digestate. Okay. Well, the, Amanda, the more glycerin that was added to the digestate, the lower the mineralization rate, too. So it, al it also slows down the microbial activity, whether that's from a direct pH effect or not. Um, I don't know. Um, good question, Harry. Um, I, I, I'm going to say um, probably, but there's been less work done on that. I will say that when, you, when your pH drops below about five and a half, 
we tend to see that whatever ammonium is released uh, in the mineralization process stays as ammonium for a long time uh, and, and may not mineralize to nitrate at all. So there's a definite impact of a pH on your nitrifying bacteria. All right. there, there tends to be less overall on the mineralization, and I think that's because when the pH drops to the point where the, micro, where the bacteria aren't so active, the fungi tend to take up the slack. So the research I've seen shows that there's less um, <coughs> a production of ammonium across pH ranges, but that whether or not the ammonium's going to the nitrate is very definitely affected by the pH of your system. And below five and a half, nitrification will be very slow, if at all. Okay, well, as always, if any unusual materials come into your planning uh, portfolios, uh, let me know, and based on the information, we can find out about it. You know, if you come up with these unusual things where there's a lot of variability in feedstocks, I'm going to want to know as much as I can um, before we um, give you an estimate. But if anything unusual shows up on your planning horizon, do get in touch with me, and if I don't already have information in my a bag of tricks, I will uh, find out what I can. What I'm finding right now is that there's a tremendous amount of work being done in uh, Europe on mineralization, and I think it's because the um, organic growing movement is so strong over there, and there's all kinds of stuff out there in, in the waste stream, and everybody wants to use it in a soil system. And so I'm really finding that the German literature in particular to be particularly rich in some of these materials. Now, what, what we need to understand is there are climatic conditions that are a little cooler than ours in a lot of cases, but at least it gives us a, a starting point um, from which we can um, get some information in a relative way as to how much nitrogen in these materials we can count on.